Okay, recording is on. Welcome everyone to the second lecture on Christian apologetics. We've been talking about the accuracy and the authenticity of uh, the Bible, the scriptures. And uh, we've been just looking at two important criteria uh, when it comes to any kind of ancient scripture how to say that, uh, you know, how, how we determine the reli reliability, the accuracy, uh, the authenticity of any ancient scripture, which is the number of manuscripts and the time gap. And so we were just talking about the Old Testament scriptures, and uh, we were looking at how amazing the Old Testament scriptures are when it comes to this whole aspect of time gap and uh, the accuracy with which they were hand copied. So what we said was, and I'm just quickly reviewing what we said in the previous class, was up until 1947, the oldest copies of the Old Testament scriptures was from 900 AD. That was when that was the time we had the oldest copies. Of course, it was done by certain Jewish scriptures, so we had those. And then in 1947, something very interesting happened, which was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So basically, these were scrolls that were found alongside the Dead Sea uh, in the Qumran caves. So what they found was they found all of the Old Testament scriptures in the Dead Sea Scrolls, except for the book of Esther. And these writings, or these, yeah, the, these copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls was from 100 or 200 BC, before the destruction of Jerusalem. It was from that time period. So we go from 900 AD to, let's say 100 or 200 BC, almost a thousand years. And what we find is there's hardly any change in the text of the scriptures, which is so amazing. It is telling us how accurately these Jewish scribes copied the text. That means it was very meticulous. And that's why we have so much confidence that now we have copies from 200 BC, which is very close to 400 BC, the, the time when the Old Testament was you know, finalized. That was the last prophet. So we're very close to the original compilation. And we also have evidence of meticulous copy by the scribes. So it really encourages our confidence in the accuracy of the text, the Old Testament text, right? Any questions on that? Everybody's clear, you're following me so far. Any questions? Any doubts? Okay, let's move forward. We'll share the notes. Okay, so we covered this, right? So if we compare other ancient writings, I mean, it's not ancient, it means, you know, from uh, early mm -hmm. BC, early AD, when you compare it, the Bible also has more manuscript, more manuscript evidence. We will, we will sort of show that. Supporting the reliability and the accuracy of the writings. And when you also look at the New Testament manuscripts, it's also very close. Right? So what do we know about Old Testament? So let's just look at the Old Testament. Um, so we know that the Dead Sea Scrolls was from 100 to 100 BC, 
the oldest Greek version was uh, from 250 BC, so almost overlap. Here you've got the Greek version, you've got the Hebrew, and then you've got manuscripts from that time. So you could compare. And uh, uh, the complete copies of the Old Testament in Greek, which is, we're talking about the Septuagint uh, version of the Old Testament, we have complete copies and they are, you know, we have different uh, compilations, uh, all from, you know, 325 AD, around this time period, and they are kept in different places. Uh, these were from different, um, uh, we could say, you know, like, like what I explained earlier, like you could call them libraries. You had copies of all of these from various libraries uh, all around this time period uh, of, of the, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament. And they've kept, they've been preserved in various places. The New Testament, we have uh, 5,500, of course, the New Testament also written in Greek. So we have 5,500 Greek manuscripts. We have 10,000 Latin manuscripts. So they were first translated from Greek to Latin. And uh, nearly 9,300 early versions in other languages that were also translated. So if you put all of these together, of course, you have a huge number, 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, totally, from the early period. Now, of course, what is interesting is that the earliest known manuscripts is from 120 AD. And uh, they were all written, like we said earlier, between 45 AD, uh, or 45 AD to about 90 AD, around that period. So we are talking about or 1995 AD. So we're talking about a very small time gap, about, you know, 25 years or less, and some 200 years. So between this time frame, the earliest manuscripts from the time of the original writing, what do we have? We have the time gap is basically like 25 to 200 years, very short time gap. And... Um, we also have uh, versions of the Bible. Like we said, it was translated into Latin from 400 AD. So again, we can compare that, you know, okay, so these people translate Latin. Let's compare, you know, what was the text from there? So we go from uh, Greek, uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew to Greek, then from Greek to Latin. We have all of these translations again. It's useful for us to compare and make sure that everything is consistent. So if you put them all in a small table like this, in general, I'm not saying for every manuscript, but in general, what we are saying is, for the Old Testament, we have more than 10,000 manuscripts with a time gap of about 150 years. In the New Testament, we have over 24,000 manuscripts with the closest time. I mean, I've, I've given the nearest time gap. The nearest time gap is about 50 years. Now, if, you, you, if we pause and think about this, compare it to, you know, the earlier table we showed about Plato and Aristotle and some other historians, what did we see? We saw a time gap of about 1,200, 1,400 years. And we saw copies, very few copies, like 250 copies, so in some cases, eight copies of manuscripts. Compare that to 10,000 or 24,000. Time gap, 1,200 years, 1,400 years. Compare that to 150 years or 50 years. So what are we saying? We are saying that the Old Testament 
just based on all of these manuscripts and you look at all these data the old testament the new testament we have so many manuscripts that we can compare we can cross reference verify that the text is right and we are also very close as close as possible to the original text so if there was any old testament i mean any ancient manuscript any ancient text that was reliable the bible the old testament the new testament is way on top most number of manuscripts shortest time gap so here are ancient works that are you know we could call it you could say it's unquestionably authentic you can't find anything more than this right so there may be you know insignificant variations of grammar or spelling and not more than one thousandth part of the New Testament, whole New Testament is affected by differences. So this is an eminent Greek scholar. So yeah, there may be some variations, grammar or spelling, but other than that, there's hardly any difference. So you compare the Bible. Again, we are not doing this to be, you know, condescending or looking down. I'm just saying. You know, you compare the Bible with other scriptures. The Quran, which was written around 600 AD uh, by Prophet Muhammad, and what he was, he claimed to have taught. Uh, compare the Ved with the Vedas, which were, uh, you could say, writings, uh, and, and some of it, mythological writings, from. Uh, the early civilizations in in and around our subcontinent. So you compare, you know, the Bible, the Quran, the Vedas. In terms of the uh, the text and what is written, the content, if we, we will see the Bible is standing out. Not only in terms of the manuscript but also in terms of the historical content compared to, again, I don't want to speak, speak ill of any of these texts, but if we can compare and, and look at this, we see that the Bible is standing out in so many ways. It's set apart in a very special way. I want to just uh, share a little bit now on what Jesus himself said, and then we will kind of come come to the canonization of, uh, we, we will talk about the inerrancy of the Bible and then come into the canonization of scripture. So the other important thing for us to keep in mind is what Jesus himself said about the Old Testament. So that is very important because for us, this is God who became man, Jesus Christ. He became man. And when Jesus himself turns around and um, speaks about the Old Testament with such, um, I would use the word respect or he, you know, he himself is affirming the Old Testament. So we know. For example, Matthew 4, when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, Jesus is saying each time it is written. He is quoting Old Testament scripture in his conflict with the devil. In his teaching, we know when Jesus was uh, teaching the people, 
he looked into the Old Testament and he pointed from the Old Testament to himself. And he said, search the scriptures. They are David, speak of me. So what scriptures was he talking about? The Old Testament scriptures, the Jewish scriptures. He said, they are speaking of me. Heaven and earth will pass away. But God's word will not pass away. So, in, in so many ways, in so many ways, Jesus was affirming the Old Testament scriptures. He, you know, and, and, and we know this that after his resurrection, when he was, you know, with his disciples, he took them through a whole journey of the Old Testament, showing them. From the Old Testament, right from Moses, all the way through, you know, the Psalms and the Prophets, how those Old Testament scriptures are speaking of him. And so this is a, this is amazing because Jesus himself affirmed the truthfulness and the accuracy of the Old Testament. Otherwise, he was not, you know, questioning, he didn't treat it lightly. This is the word of God. Thy word is truth. So, if Jesus himself affirmed the authenticity of the Old Testament, the act, you know, the authority of the Old Testament, we can be that much more confident. You know, this is this is true. This is true. Now, generally speaking, you know, there are people who will want to point out problems in the Bible. It may, it will try to point out maybe sometimes historical errors, sometimes they say, hey, this is, you know, these things are wrong. So how do we respond to that? I want to just mention two things here. That first of all, if we look at the scriptures carefully, there is what is what we refer to as law of non-contradiction in logical thinking. So uh, when we look at some records in the Old Testament or even in the Gospels, um, it may seem like the two Gospel writers are not telling the same story properly. They're not saying there, there's some, some, you know, some mismatch. But then actually, it is not a mismatch. What is described may be different, but they are not contradictory. So how can I explain it? Suppose, you know, I, 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 um, I met, and this, I'm just giving an example. Suppose at nine o'clock, I met with John, and uh, so suppose John and Jim, they met me at nine o'clock in, in the morning and they met me in the office. And then uh, later in the day, I'm meeting somebody and I tell them, I met John at nine. Then later in the day, I meet somebody else and I tell them, I met Jim at nine or I met John and Jim at nine. Now, these statements are different. To somebody, I said, I met John at nine. To somebody else, I said, I met Jim at nine. To somebody else, I said, I met John and Jim at nine. So all three statements are different. But they're all right. Because indeed, I met John and Jim at nine. Just that my emphasis was different each time. Once I emphasized that I met John, to another person I emphasized I met Jim, to another person I emphasized I met John and Jim. All three are correct. They're true, true statements. They're not contradictory. They are different, but they're all true. So this is the law of non-contradiction. So in the Bible, you know, for example, I'll just give an example. Uh, Matthew might say, 
when Jesus came to Gadara, there were two demon-possessed men. Mark might say, or I'm not sure it's a little Matthew or Mark, but Mark might say there was one demon-possessed man who was very vicious. Now, he, both are narrating the same incident, Jesus coming to Gadara. One is saying there were two, they're focusing on both of the people. But one was focusing on one of them, the one who was more violent, more vigorous, uh, aggressive. And so Jesus, he met this demon possessed man. Are they, con are they different? Yeah, they're different. Are they contradictory? They're not contradictory. Because they could have been two. One is focusing on two, mentioning both of them are there. One is focusing on the person who was more aggressive, more of whom Jesus dealt first. So they're not contradictory. They are different, but they're not contradictory. Okay. So you, you will find in the Bibles, you have some narratives, historical narratives or statements like this, which are, they're talking about the same thing. They look different, but they're not contradictory. They're not opposite to each other. So we can, if you know, if we study them carefully and we can say, look, we can explain it like this. It's not a contradiction. Yes, it's different. But then that, that happens all the time in, in how we report situations. We write about situations. The emphasis could be on different things. And so we might emphasize different things in different situations of that same event. Second uh, useful thing to do is that there, uh, if we do sufficient background and uh, information research, we can clear up difficult passages. So it is true that in the Bible, there will be certain passages that are not easy to understand, or um, there might be uh, situations where we like say, why did he say this? Why did he do this? Right? Uh, it's not easy to understand, but then, but uh, to us, it may seem inappropriate. It may seem wrong. But then we go into the context, the background. It will help us understand. So example, if somebody reads, you know, how Jesus dealt with the, so I'm just giving one example. If somebody reads how Jesus dealt with this sort of woman from Canaan, that's like he's so rude. How can he say, I can't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs? Right? So when we read it in English, the English translation, we say, like, no, this is not right. And, you know, we could make up a lot of things uh, based on just that reading of that sentence. But then what do you do? understand the background, understand what was happening. What do we know? Well, we know that in his earthly ministry, Jesus was focusing on the house of Israel. He was focusing on the Jewish people. So that is why he said, I cannot take the children's bread and give it out. Now, secondly, when he used uh, the word, I can't give it to the dogs, he was not referring uh, to, I mean, he, was not, he was not saying the Gentiles are unworthy or so on. No. He's using a, a, a language of their day and time, referring to how the Gentiles would be addressed. The Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. Now, when we translate today, uh, we, it looks very harsh in the English language. But the context is, when Jesus was ministering his earthly ministry, he was focusing on the Jews, the house of Israel. Therefore, he, he said, I cannot you know, minister now out of that. And secondly, it was a language of their day to refer to the Gentiles. It was not, a, it was not an insult. It was not a, you know, a, a demeaning thing. So we interpret it from that perspective. Right? So uh, I'm just giving one example. So like this you could think when 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 when, when there is something seemingly difficult then okay understand the culture understand the history or do some background and check then things become clearer and it's not as difficult as we initially thought okay so in in the scriptures 
uh, this is something we need to do. When people say, hey, there are contradictions in the Bible, these things are like this. Okay, let's take some time to study it. Then we can explain uh, explain it the right way, right? Okay, let me pause here to see any questions before I change uh, topic. And uh, Everybody's okay with me so far? Okay, any questions? All right. Okay, no questions. Fine. All right, all of that. Okay. Let's go forward. All right, thank you for your comments on the chat. Uh, so I, I can understand all of you following. All right, let me, sorry. Let me go and share the notes again. All right. So now we're changing a little bit. Okay. Now, we mentioned earlier about the 66 books of the Bible. Uh, we, we use the word canon. Canon. So literally, canon means you know a standard or a straight line or something that's used to measure, keep things in line. So when we say canon, it means that these books have met a certain standard, and they're measured. They are measured up to a straight line, a criteria for their selection. So we refer to that as the, the canon of scripture. So the question many people ask is, how did it happen? And why only these 66 books are in the Bible? Why not others? Right? So the answer is pretty simple. There was a standard or there was a canon or a standard or a criteria by which these 66 books were selected. Now, of course, man selected it, but God was behind it. Okay. So what was the criteria? It is the, the book had to be inspired by God. Right? <coughs> Sorry. That means for any book, to fit into this, into the Bible, the 66 books, it had to be clearly inspired by God. So any book that had any literary work that was purely a work of literature and that was not inspired by God was not allowed to be part of the 66 books. So the first, the first, the 39 books of the Old Testament. The Jews, meaning the Jewish elders, the leaders, recognized these 39 books, which we refer to as the Old Testament, as truly inspired by God. They were spoken or, uh, and written based on the words of prophets or actual inspiration. So that is how the 39 books were selected by the Jewish elders. So remember, this was done by 400 BC. So the Jewish elders, their criteria was it had to be spoken by a prophet or it had to be given by inspiration. It had to be known that this was given by inspiration. So like we said, there were a lot of other books and other things that were written. But they were not included because of this criteria. The books had to be inspired. Did a prophet speak it? Were the words of a prophet recorded by somebody? Uh, so were they actually inspired? If it was, then it will fit into the 66. It will be part of the 39 books, part of the old, their Jewish scriptures. So that was the criteria by which these 39 books were selected. And it was done by the Jewish elders religious leaders themselves by 400 BC. Now we know that 
the Christian faith came out of Judaism. So what do we mean by that? Jesus was born as a Jew. He validated the 39 books of the Old Testament. He quoted from it. Like we said earlier, he quoted from it. He affirmed it. And then he, he taught from it to his disciples. He taught from that. So Jesus is coming to introduce the kingdom of God. But he's teaching from these 39 books to the early disciples. So the early disciples recognized, recognized the 39 books. Jesus was teaching them from it. Then when, so Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, ascension, the church was born, the day of Pentecost. Remember, all of them were Jews at that time. And they were preaching from these 39 books. The very first sermon, Peter stood up and said, you know, this is what Joel the prophet prophesied. So they are preaching and teaching from these Old Testament scriptures. Jesus had affirmed it to them. Jesus had taught it to taught to them from the Old Testament scriptures. Now they are preaching. So the early church, they preached and taught from the Old Testament scriptures. So the Old Testament scriptures now became part of the church, the New Testament church. And then after about 20 25 years, or, yeah, or I would say from AD 30 to about AD 45, so 15 years, we had the apostles start writing. So, of course, we know most of them were written by the apostle Paul, and the other apostles wrote, they recorded for us. So, we had the 27 books. And the criteria for these 27 books was similar. It had to be inspired by God, but it had to be written by those who are recognized as apostles and elders by the early church. So there were other writings during this time. So we said the early church continued with the 39 books. It was part of their teaching and preaching. But then, the apostles, the early apostles, between 8045 to 8090, that period of time, were writing scriptures, as, were writing books as well, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But what was the criteria? Same thing. It had to be inspired by God, and it had to be written by those who were recognized as apostles, or those who were recognized as leaders from the early, by the early church. So that constituted the 27 books. Now, of course, man was involved in this whole process. Yeah, yes, man was involved. You know, the Jewish elders were involved. The early church was, elders were involved. They recognized, you know. Um, so man was involved. Yeah, man is the one who made the selection. But they had a criteria. They had a canon. They had a standard by which they made the selection. Mainly, it had to be inspired by God. Old Testament had to be given by the prophets. The New Testament was inspired by God, had to be given by the apostles or those recognized by the apostles. And so based on that, these documents, these written texts were put together and other things were rejected. No, no, this is not valid. This cannot be. They're not being included. They are so on. Now, what has happened is that uh, the book of a, a, Apocrypha, which we don't have in our Protestant Bible, but in the Catholic Bible, the, so the Apocrypha, those, those, those works were not recognized as inspired. 
by the Jewish elders and leaders. It's not recognized as inspired. They didn't consider it as inspired. But the Catholic Bible, in Catholic Bible, includes it as part of their literature. It's part of what, okay, this was the literature written during those 400 years. So like we said Malachi, then there was 400 years or so before Christ came. This was what was written. They included there. Now, it was not recognized either by Jesus or by the Jewish elders or by the early apostles, not recognized any of them, but the Catholic Bible includes it as literature work, uh, as part of their Bible. So we don't consider it as, uh, as, as part of scripture. We don't consider it as inspired. Uh, and so we don't even deal with it or we don't teach from it because neither Jesus nor the early apostles taught from that. They did it. It was left out. Okay. So if somebody asks us, you know, why these 66 books? How were the 66 books selected? Well, when we say canon, it means a certain standard. What was the main standard? It had to be inspired by God. It had to be spoken by the prophets. The Old Testament was already recognized by the Jewish elders. Jesus affirmed it. He used it in his teaching. It was passed on to the early church. They used it in their teachings. So we know that 39 books of the Old Testament, they were abandoned. Then how did these 27 books come in? Well, these were, again, the same criteria. It had to be inspired by God. It had to be written by the apostles or those who were recognized by the apostles. And that was recognized by the early church. And so those 27 books became part of the New Testament. So then the Old Testament and New Testament was put together. It became the canon of scripture or the 66 books meet the certain standard. They make up the Bible. Okay. Any questions on that so far? Everybody's with me. I know a lot of information from different sides, uh, but you're all with me so far. Okay. Any questions? All right. All right, we just take a little bit more time and before we pause today. All right, let's go forward. Oops. All right. Mm. Okay. So the um, the Hebrew scriptures, now this is just a little bit of overview, okay, of the Old Testament. Now you would have studied this in your Old Testament survey, so but I'm just kind of review, reviewing this a little bit. So the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, uh, was essentially divided as uh, the law, which was referred to as the law of Moses, so the first five books, uh, the prophets, and, uh, uh, and the sacred writings, also known as Hagiographa. So the prophets really considered of uh, the books of Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, which we, we call as 1st and 2nd Kings, and then all the uh, major prophets, and then the 12 minor prophets. And then the uh, sacred writings consist of all the other books, mainly uh, Psalms, and Proverbs, uh, Job, Ecclesiastes, and these other books that were written during this time. Right? So these were the books that were selected by, uh, like we said, the Jewish elders over time, uh, based on them being inspired, recognized to be inspired, and they were part of the Hebrew Bible, which then was passed on to us. Okay. Um, yeah, so the end of the Old Testament basically comes in when the, the last prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, were prophesying, and after that, there is no more. Hebrew or Old Testament, what we refer to as the Old Testament scriptures. So Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi were the last of the prophets, and then there was a spirit of silence for 400 years. The last books of history, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, um, and uh, with them, the Old Testament canon was completed. So basically, um, Ezra was in Jerusalem, 
I mean, he compiled all of these things. So Ezra the scribe was uh, very instrumental in preserving the Old Testament scriptures for us, keeping that for us. So he's a very important person from that perspective in, in maintaining the Old Testament scriptures for us. Right? Uh, so this is just some general information. Right? So overall, like we had mentioned earlier, uh, everything was completed. The Old Testament was completed around 400 BC. And uh, then that was it. Nothing was added after that. They took all the sacred writings by that time. And uh, so Ezra the priest, like we mentioned, uh, he was very instrumental in preserving the collection of the Old Testament canon uh, after they came back from the... Um, uh, the this, this 70 years of captivity, they came back and he was very instrumental in preserving the sacred writings. So he's highly, what to say, uh, honored, respected among uh, the, the Jewish Ezra the priest. Right? And uh, this was the criteria that was used on the Old Testament books, which I had summarized earlier. You know, was it given by inspiration? Was it a prophet of God speaking? Did it maintain doctrine throughout? So, and and then of course the writing survived over time. And Malachi was the last recognized prophet. Within the end of the thirty-nine books, uh, were brought to completion. So that's just general information. You could take take some time, little time to read it. And uh, I've kind of summarized all this for you. Um, but uh, Apocrypha and then the New Testament. Again, same things. Same criteria was used. And uh, Old Testament, Jesus, Jesus' affirmation of the Old Testament, and then the Apostles' work. So, okay. So let's pause here. I will pick up from here and talk a little bit about the early church, um, uh, how they went about it. This was 18, uh, 8367, how they canonized or they came to accept you know, the canon of scripture. So I will pick up from here next time. Till this, I've kind of summarized things for you. You can read the text, uh, read the lecture notes, but we will pick up from here next week and we will uh, finish uh, this whole section on about the Bible and how it came to us, okay? Um, all right, let's see. All right, let's see, be in class. Okay. Okay, thank you, Collins, and thank you for your feedback. Appreciate it. All right, so, you know, whenever I, um, I just make a few comments. When I, whenever I think about the Bible, think about how amazing, you know, God brought it about. You know, we, uh, we take it for granted, you know, when... <laughs> Uh, when we open up our Bible and we read it, we take it for granted. Yeah, okay, I'm reading my Bible. But if you think about how, starting from Moses, how the Old Testament came to us, how the New Testament came to us, and today we are so blessed. We have uh, many versions of the Bible. We will talk about it next week. So many versions of the Bible, we can read it in different versions. We can read it on our computer. We can read it on our phone. I tell you, we, uh, we are so blessed. We are so blessed that God would do this for us. And he would give us something very simple, the scriptures. He would say, this is my word for you. It's so amazing. And so I want to just encourage us, you know, to have that full confidence in the Word of God, in the written scriptures, and of course, to base our life and ministry on the written scriptures. Okay, we'll pick this up next week. We'll go forward uh, in this next week. May I request somebody, please, to um, close uh, close the class in prayer, and we will dismiss after that. Anyone, please.
Go ahead, Tafina. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for the beautiful day and for the beautiful class we had. God, we thank you for this precious words that is in our hands, Lord. When we look back and we think how it is formed, how it got collected, what an amazing uh, thing that we are right now here with the Bibles in our hands and we can read it every day and we can uh, get deeper and deeper with you each and every day, God. We are so thankful for giving us these words, God, as we are learning, be with us and guide us and help us, help me and all my classmates and our classmates to get deeper and deeper into it while we read it, fill us with your revelations that your Holy Spirit guide us. We are so thankful right now, Jesus. Our heart is filled with thankfulness for giving us these amazing words and instructions so that we can live a beautiful life with you. You're amazing and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, please have your break and we'll get ready for our next class. I'll see you again next week. We'll continue this. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. God bless.